because most of the spaces we design are in, in schools, are isolated spaces for rhetorical questions for which we already have the answers. And the answers are already in the back of the book. And the fact that those answers already exist means they're not engaging. Who cares? Everybody already knows that. Being the first person to discover the North Pole is exciting. Being the 9,000th person to go there and you can, you know, get a plane there and, you know, have a little holiday, that's not the same thing. Seth Godin, this year's Edge Class, said, Never again is someone going to pay you to give them answers they can look up online. They will only pay you to solve problems until you have answers. If you want to find a principle for building your schools, if you want to find something that's the new Nordic school, that's it. Because instead of having, right now we're just designing these things that are about isolation and control, not access and community. So let's let me give you a formula that, that proves this. So if you're in a context you don't understand it, you use research in that context and collaboration to understand it, and you amplify that with technology, in most cases we would call that, that's really wise, that's prowess, that's using your resources to understand the world around you. In school we call that, <laughs> And we're building these spaces that are really about processing children through by their data manufacture. I mean, this is not an inspired learning space. It's the same old thing we've had forever. We used to be able, by the way, to dream big dreams. Like, can you imagine a world where you could have a device in your hand and that device would let you video chat with people far away? Or can you imagine being able to have digitized books that you could read and, and think about and you know, could go anywhere. Uh, well, provided you had a giant machine. And could you imagine having a library in your home with access to all the world's knowledge, which you could then, for some inexplicable reason, present on the roof? I don't know how that works. Can you imagine having an answer machine in your house that if you had a question, you could look it up and it would tell you what the answers were, and you could, you know, see and, and have media, and you could print stuff out, and even you know you could hear the first recording of the photograph. You could explore the world. Can you imagine a world like that? That used to be science fiction, <laughs> but it's not anymore. So, is this today's science fiction? <laughs> really? You're dreaming small dreams if that's science fiction for you. Your science fiction isn't even as good as stuff 100 years ago. So dream bigger. Right? Because what we don't need is a bunch of stuff that's just about consumption again. And primarily in our schools, what we want is we want students' attendance and their compliance and their uniformity. And it's accidental as those are the initials of my school. Right? Because what we're really doing is we're preparing students to become, well, Next time. In fact, we're trying to standardize students in many cases so they're the same thing. But if you build a machine where all the parts are the same, it's not a machine that works particularly well. It's like the Cavendish banana. Do you know the Cavendish banana? <laughs> you look it up after the <laughs> Tell me about your banana seat. Some of you are looking puzzled. Why is that? Because your banana has no seeds, because it's a cabbage banana, which was bred to be seedless. Now, banana seeds are not terribly large, even real bananas, but they're aesthetically unpleasing. They're black, and they have this kind of dark thing. People didn't like it. Banana seeds are huge, creamy color. So they bred these bananas to be without seeds, which is great. How do you plant new seedless bananas? Where do you get the new plants from? We take the cutting of the old plant, and we plant that, and then you take cutting that, and we plant that, and you take cutting that. And what you get is the monoculture. Every banana is a clone of all the other bananas, which is no problem, until, as happened, started happening about 50 years ago, there's a fungus that attacks cabbage bananas. And those bananas, because they have no seeds, they can't adapt. They're all the same. So they can't fight off that disease. In fact, there are two cultivars of the cabbage banana already that you literally can no longer plant anywhere on the planet because they will be attacked instantly and they will die. And 
and soon that will happen as well, capital strands, because they're not real. What we need to be doing is getting people out into the world where we need the diversity, not their uniformity, their diversity to make real things in the real world. We all know that education has to transform somehow. But let me tell you, taking the tools of the past and shoving them into the tools of the present is not transformation. And what we need to be doing is making sure that our educational system stops burning off so much energy as heat without producing light. Every class should be about students starting OK. Maybe we start in that intimate setting of the classroom. But by the end of that class, they should be out in the real world making light. We need to be capturing that energy, not losing it again. So instead of just having a, a pedagogy focus on consumption, first of all, it's deliberative, we consume it. Let's add a few C's to that, right? Let's add curation, which is what happens here in this museum, where we take all these pieces and we assemble them together into a new story so that people can understand stuff. And we add to that creation the stuff that we make ourselves, and we leverage collaboration and all of that. Because having, you know, one C is not very powerful, but C4 is really explosive. And if I look at the average assignment, I mean, it starts out at my desk, it goes to my student's desk, they do some stuff, they send it back to my desk, I grade it, it goes back to their desk. Sometimes, they sometimes don't even come back to pick it up. And that does have an impact on the world. But it's not necessarily the most positive impact on the world. I mean, I've estimated that in the average class of my school, what we burn off as irrelevant heat is about 5,000 hours per, per teacher. These students spend about 50 hours on those final projects that they don't even care about. I don't care about. Nobody cares about it. It's just going through the motions. And there are 25 students in the course. There are four courses. 5,000 hours. How could that benefit this community? How could that benefit the world? And that image of education is a very old one. It's one from Aristotle, in fact. Right? So there are flowers out in the world, and those flowers need to be cultivated also need to be accessed. And so the idea is a bee goes out into the world and gathers nectar and pollen and brings it back as food for the hive. And has a responsibility to tell others in the hive how to go out and get that stuff, right? So that they can go out and gather it and bring it back as well. It becomes a recursive process, right? And that recursive process generates two really interesting things. It generates food in the world, stuff that will grow again, and it generates food for the bees, and food for us. So what we need to do, I think, is take the linearity and the isolation and the hierarchy and the simulation out of school and replace it with some things like recursivity and connection and community and engagement. That's critically important. I just nearly killed myself. Which many of you are probably excited about. Let me give you one example of this. And I, I finish up here in just a moment. Oh, I can't do that. I just actually. I'm skipping some slides before I got them right. One of our sociology teachers, ACU, we used to teach sociology, taught a class about disability. And he used to teach in the room like this. He put stuff up on the board, and people would watch it, and they think about it. Here's how he teaches it now. Every student gets a wheelchair. And they're dropped off in the center of our town. And they roll around exploring the world. And they're, they, their classes for two hours record your experiences. So, you know, they take movies with their laptop, or I mean, with their iPads or with their iPhone. They record audio, they look stuff up. The law, they, they found a really interesting thing. In the US, there's a law about access, about accessibility of public spaces. So there's a library downtown. The front doors of the library are there. The handicapped accessible parking is right in front of it, according to the law. That's correct. Between those two, seven steps. <laughs> ah, but there's a ramp. The entrance to the ramp is around the corner, halfway down the building. By the way, there's no way to get onto the sidewalk until you get to where the ramp starts. So you actually have to wheel through traffic and through a stop sign to get onto 
with the ramp, which you then have to roll all the way back around the building to get into the front door. The student said, this is ridiculous. We need to get this changed. So they wrote a proposal to the city council, and they changed it. Those students fundamentally understood disability and equality in a very different way than they had sat in the room. Because they were making life in the real world. And that's, that's what we have to do. So, the thing is, our students are connected in ways unlike ever before. And the last thing you want them to do is cutting off those connections. Because this is your classroom. This is where we need Danish students, Danish wisdom, and Danish ingenuity. Combine all of the students from all the other places to solve the world's big problems. That's something worth doing in education. Now, it might be 